it's great to be here with you this morning. Uh, there's a lot happening in the world, you know, and, and I think what we're experiencing around us at the moment is, is the great danger that we encounter all the time, and that is that people get caught up in their own little worlds. You know, and the, the reason it's important for you to come to something like this is because from time to time, it's critically important that we step back from who we are and where we are and what we're doing and take another look at who we are and where we are and what we're doing. Because if we don't do that, we do get caught up in our own little worlds and it's a really dangerous place to be. The reason it's a dangerous place to be is because the way we see the world determines the way we live our lives. When you see someone living their life in a certain way, it's because they have a particular world view. And the way we see the world determines the way we live our lives. And, and most of us never really sit down and think about what is our worldview. How do you see the world? I mean, there's almost 7 billion people on the planet. And if we reduce the world's population to 100 people, proportionally, 57 of those 100 people would come from Asia, 21 from Europe, 14 from North and South America, and 8 from Africa. 51 would be women, 49 would be men, 68 of those 100 people would not be able to read and write. How do you see the world? 68% of the world's population still can't read and write. Six of those 100 people would own and control almost 50% of the world's wealth. Five of those six people would be US citizens. Three of those five people would live on the same street at the North Shore of Long Island. How do you see the world? Because the way we see the world determines the way we live our lives. One of those 100 people would have just been born. One of those 100 people would be just about to die. And only one of those 100 people would have been to college. How do you see that? Maybe in your world, everyone goes to college, but on planet Earth, one in 100 people have a college experience. One third of the world's population dying from lack of bread. One third of the world's population dying from lack of justice. And one third of the world's population dying from overeating. How was breakfast? <laughs> How do you see the world? Because the way we see the world determines the way we live our lives. And every time we encounter God in any genuine way, every time we encounter God in any genuine way, we're reminded of two simple realities. People were made to be loved, and things were made to be used. But too often we love things and we use people. And every time we encounter God, we're challenged to put things back in order, challenged to put things back in perspective, challenged to make things right, to put things as they really should be. What are we called to do as Christians? It's to challenge people's worldview. The first Christians challenged people's worldview. The first Christians challenged people's view of themselves, challenged people's view of the world, challenged people's view of God. That's what we're called to do. You know? and, and how did they primarily do it? With their life. They lived differently. They loved differently. They worked differently. And they were intriguing. People were intrigued by the lives of the first Christians. People were fascinated with them. And so my question for you today is, who does your life intrigue? Who's intrigued by your life? Who looks at you and says, he's different or she's different? They live differently, they love differently, they work differently, because ultimately that is the power of Christianity. The gospel, I mean, it's a good read, but when the stuff is actually lived, it's phenomenally powerful. And that doesn't matter if you take a little guy and drop him down in the middle of Italy, in the Middle Ages, give him a brown robe, call him Francis, and bam, you've got it. It's not take, like it takes a thousand really holy people in your parish to get the job done. You take another woman, four foot nothing, drop her down in the middle of modern day Calcutta, and bam, you got it. You know, the power of the gospel when it's actually lived is phenomenal, and it's intriguing to people. And so the question we've got to ask is, whose life is intrigued by ours? Because at the end of the day, Christianity is a billboard campaign. That's how Jesus set it up. Christianity is a billboard campaign. You and I, we're the billboards. He sends us out into the world to send a message to the world. The question becomes, what message is on your billboard? What message is on your billboard? Catholic and miserable? <laughs> Catholic and surviving? Or Catholic and thriving? Or dynamic Catholic living an extraordinary life and thriving? What message is on your billboard? Because everyone you encounter every day gets the message on your billboard. People you talk to get the message. People who pass by you get the message. People who work around you get the message. What message is on your billboard? Because every single one of us sending a message to the world. And why is it so important? 
Well, it's important because, you know, from time to time, we meet somebody who's done something really stupid, don't we? You know, I mean, not just a little bit stupid, I mean monumentally stupid. I mean ridiculously and woefully stupid, you know? And, and these people come into our lives, and what do we do? Well, we're Christians, aren't we? So we judge them. <laughs> you know, we think to ourselves, what were you thinking, fool? We think to ourselves, you really thought that was going to make you happy? And then all of a sudden the light bulb goes off in our heads. We think to ourselves, I should invite this person to come to church with me sometime. I know, radical idea for a Catholic, isn't it? I mean, crazy, radical idea for a Catholic. But stick with me, let's see where it goes, you know. <laughs> well, now it takes you about three months to build up the courage, doesn't it? So you've got three months of judging, then you've got three months of courage building. Finally, after six months, you come to this person, you say, excuse me, I, I was wondering, uh, uh, would you like to come to church with me sometime? You know what they say? Why? You say, well, uh, I've been noticing you've been having a few uh, difficulties in your life. I was thinking it might be good for you. You know what they say? Why? You say, well, I mean, it looks like you've tried everything else. I mean, what have you got to lose? <laughs> you know what they say? Why? <laughs> have you ever wondered what they're thinking when you or I invite them to church? Let me give you a four-second tour of their mind at that very moment. They're looking at you and me, and they think to themselves, hold on a minute, let me get this right. If going to your church is going to make me like you, oh, no. Oh, no, I'm busy on Sunday. Next Sunday, I'm moving out of town next Sunday. Where are the billboards? They've got to look at your life and my life and think, she's got something I can't live without. She's found a way, or he's found a way to live life that's more powerful than the way I'm living life. We have to intrigue people. That's what the first Christians had. That's what we've lost. We've got to get it back. And it's not getting it back by doing extraordinary things. It's getting it back doing the ordinary things in extraordinary ways. It's getting it back by living differently, loving differently, working differently, so that people see there's something genuine here. There's something authentic here. Because the whole world is starving for something authentic. The whole world. Our culture is just so desperate for something authentic, someone authentic, to step forth and lead and speak to them. Now is our time. People are hungry for what we have to offer. We have to become that authentic voice. We have to become that intriguing life because you might be the only person who has the ability to reach that person. It's you in your everyday life. It's you in your everyday life, 10 times more powerful than anything I can ever say. So this morning, I want to talk to you a little bit about my spiritual journey. I wrote about it in my book, A Call to Joy, and, but I, I want to go deeper into a, a relationship that really had a powerful impact on me that, that isn't in the book, and, and ha I haven't written about anywhere. Uh, last week, it was 15 years, celebrated 15 years since I gave my first talk last week, and, and it's been an incredible journey, and, and what I want to do is I want to take you back to where that started and how that started, and, and even before I started speaking and writing, and, and what was the genesis of the ministry that, that so many of you know about today. You know, I, I grew up in Sydney, Australia, and I have seven brothers, and, and I'm the fourth of eight boys. It was, it was great. I mean, growing up with all the brothers was just, it was a great experience, you know. And, and when I graduated from high school, I went off to college to study a double degree in marketing and finance to plot my ascent to the top of the business world so that I could be successful, so that I could have all the stuff because the world had taught me if I had all that stuff, then I'd be happy. And, uh, but toward you know, my, my late teen years, I was at a barbecue one Sunday afternoon with some of my mates. I looked across the barbecue and there was a friend of mine, my family's there really. At the time, he was probably about 15 years older than me. You know, actually, come to think of it, he's probably still 15 years older than me. <laughs> you know, that's sort of how it works. <laughs> you know, I didn't really want to be seen with the old people, so I was avoiding him for the afternoon. He was probably about 33, something like that. And, uh, but about halfway through the afternoon, he came over. He said to me, how are you, Matthew? I said, fine. He said, how's college? I said, fine. You see, when I was a teenager, the answer to every question was fine. You know, how was your day? Fine. What did you do? Fine. <laughs> What would you like for dinner? Fine. <laughs> you know, but he was a doctor. Good doctors, they know how to ask questions. And this is one of the things, you've got to learn how to ask good questions. You know, you go to the doctor, what does he say? He says, where does it hurt? 
you say in my chest. He says, show me where it hurts. Show him exactly. When did it start hurting? When did it start hurting? What happened around the time it started hurting? You know, was there some particular event that happened? These are the kind of questions you could ask. Are you happy? Why aren't you happy? How long have you been unhappy for? Have you got a restlessness within you? Do you feel discontented? Do you feel unsatisfied? When did that start? When was the last time you remember not having that? What happened around that time? You know, and he asked questions around my life for about 10 minutes and then he, he paused, he looked me straight in the eye, he said, Matthew, you're not happy, are you? I said, excuse me? He said, he said you're not happy, are you? I was ashamed to admit it. I, th I think our culture teaches us that. I think our culture teaches us to pretend that everything's fine, even when it isn't. But I knew he knew. And I think secretly I, I wanted someone to help me. I knew something was missing. I, I don't have one of these stories where oh, my whole life was falling apart. Everything was going good. That's how I knew something was missing. Because <laughs> everything was going good and I still wasn't really happy. I still had that restlessness, the sense that something was wrong. You know, he said to me, well, what do you think's causing this? I said, I don't know. I do well in college, got a great group of friends, got a great girlfriend, got a great part-time job. I'm doing well in my sports. I don't know what's wrong. He said, maybe nothing's wrong. I said, excuse me? He said, maybe something's missing. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, maybe you want to think about spending some time at church. I said, no, I go, I go to church on Sundays. He said, yeah, that's not what I mean. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, maybe you want to think about stopping by church on the way to school each morning. Just spend 10 minutes in the quiet there. I thought to myself, what sort of religious freak <laughs> do I have on my hands here? I didn't tell him I thought he was a freak, you know. I just sort of nodded and smiled. You know how we do that sometimes? I noticed some of you have been doing it for about 15 minutes. <laughs> So I just sort of nodded and smiled and, and, and resolved to ignore everything he had to say. But I guess it was about you know, six weeks later, the restlessness hasn't gone away. It's getting worse, in fact. I'm on my way to school one morning. I've got 10 minutes to spare. I've got nothing to lose. So I step in the back of church. I sit way up the back. And I spend 10 minutes planning my day. I'm going to go here. I'm going to go there. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And just by planning my day, I felt so peaceful. I think it's the first time in my adult life where I remember feeling genuinely peaceful, you know? And I liked that. I liked it a lot. I came back again the next day, set up the back, planned my day. I did this every day for about three weeks and then one day it occurred to me that, you know, planning a day isn't really prayer. <laughs> I mean, in the strictest sense of the word, you know? So I decided to pray a little bit. I said, uh, all right, listen up, God. <laughs> Your servant is speaking. I want this, 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 I want this. Get busy on that, God, I'll see you tomorrow. So proud of myself, you know. I mean, now that I was really praying, you know. I mean, talking to God and whatnot. You know, I did this every day for about three weeks, and then one day I'm sitting up the back, I've finished planning my day, I've finished giving God his instructions for the day, you know. And I remember on this particular day, I, uh, I had this problem. And I remember just looking up toward the tabernacle. Simple prayer in my heart, saying, all right, God, i got a problem here. This is the situation. These are the circumstances. God, what do you think I should do? And with that one question, my life began to change. It is the question that every life pivots on. It's the question, God, what do you think I should do? And it is the question that has almost completely disappeared from the inner dialogue of modern men and modern women. We don't ask the question anymore. You know, when we've got a big decision to make, we come to just about everyone who knows just about nothing about just about nothing, we ask them what they think we should do. <laughs> all the answers are in the tabernacle. Instead of coming to the guy who's got all the answers to all the questions. And that's the question that changes lives. You know, in my book, Building Better Families, I spoke about how we ask kids the wrong questions. And if you ask the wrong questions, you always get the wrong answers. Our lives, our lives are defined by the questions we ask. 
our lives are just answers to the questions we ask. We teach our kids to ask the wrong questions. They're always going to come up with the wrong answers. And the biggest example in our culture of this is when they're this big, we say, what do you want to do when you grow up? When they're in high school, we say, what do you want to do in college? When they're in college, we say, what do you want to do when you graduate? When they graduate college, they go out and they do what they want to do. Does it make them happy? Absolutely not. They wake up when they're 35, 40, 45, 50, leading lives of quiet desperation, wondered how it ever happened. They walk the path we taught them to walk. We ask them the wrong question. You ask the wrong question, you always come up with the wrong answer. Because at the end of the day, I don't know about you, but I've had pretty significant experience in doing what I want to do, and it never made me happy. But the reality is, is doing what we want to do doesn't make us happy. And yet that's the question we ingrain in our children, in the children of our culture. Rather than asking them when they're this big, what did God say to you today? First time you ask them the question, they'll look at you like you're some sort of freak alien. Expect it. Second time you ask the question, they'll have an answer. Simply by asking the question, you teach them to do what? Listen to the voice of God in their lives. You come out of church on Sunday, what did God say to your church today? We've got to change the questions. Ask the wrong questions, always get the wrong answers. And the question that my life pivoted on, I stumbled upon by accident and by grace. You know, God, what do you think I should do in this situation? And that's when my life began to change. Ten minutes a day. I've spent 15 years trying to convince people to spend 10 minutes a day in prayer. Because that's where it started for me. You know, I don't have unrealistic expectations or ambitions for where people should start. I think what is radically missing is material for people who are just trying to make sense of their life, just trying to make sense of church from the pew, just trying to get started in the journey. We have to feed those people. They are starving to death. We have to encourage people to develop more and more material for people who are just getting started in the journey. Where did it start for me? Ten minutes a day. You know, and people say to me all the time, do I have to do it in church? No, you don't have to do it in church. You can take a walk in a quiet place. You can sit in your favorite chair in a corner at home. Is it more powerful at church? Yeah, absolutely. Is it more effective at church? Yeah, absolutely. And what are your priorities? Because at the end of the day, if I put $1,000 in $100 bills on the front step of the altar for every single person, all they had to do each morning was come to church, spend 10 minutes in prayer, and then they could pick up their $1,000 cash. How many days do you think you'd miss in the next 90 days? <laughs> you know? And at the end of the day, if you look back on the last 90 days, if you look back on the last 90 days, some days are better than other days. Yes or yes? The question I challenge you to ask is, how do your best days begin? How do your best days begin? Because as you look back at those 90 days, there's a pretty good chance that if you start a day in a certain way, you have a massive influence on whether it's going to be one of those better days or one of those not so good days. How do your best days begin? Most people don't even have this self-awareness. Most people don't even have the self-awareness of how their best days begin. They just sort of stumble into a day and the day either turns out good for them or not so good for them. They just sort of stumble into it rather than proactively thinking, okay, how do my best days begin? Some people would say, well, my best days begin at church. Other people would say, yeah, no, my best days don't begin at church. My best days begin by getting to bed at the right time the night before. Some people say, my best days begin by planning out what I'm going to do the next day the night before. How do your best days begin? I don't think there's one prescription for everybody. I do think that we have a, a, an obligation to live life to the fullest. You know, John 10, verse 10, I have come so that you may have life and have it to the fullest. You know, where is that life? Because that's what people are hungry for. And the first step in every day is knowing how do our best days begin? And then in the next 90 days, how many days are we going to start like that? And it's simple stuff. And this is what people need. They need simple, practical ways to get in touch with God. And the reality is, is that you can't convince a starving person to give their food away. You can't convince a starving person to give their food away. Okay, but when you've got a lot of food, much easier to give the food away. Much easier to share the food. Mm -hmm. Culturally, spiritually, financially, people are starving. They're under too much pressure. We have, to, we have to find ways to help them make their lives work. And the biggest human need in our culture today is just busyness. 
people just too busy. Have to teach people to simplify their lives. And the truth is, it's already in them. You get them to spend that 10 minutes a day. 10 minutes a day in the classroom of silence. That's how my life, or my walk with God, really became serious. This guy who I met at this barbecue and challenged me, I bumped into him about three weeks after I'd started going to church each day for 10 minutes on the way to school. And um, he said to me, you know, how are you, Matthew? I said, fine. He said, uh, <laughs> he said, how's college? I said, fine. No, he said, have you, have you been stopping by church? I said, you know what? I have. He was shocked, stunned, and amazed. Nearly fell over, I think. He said to me, how often have you been doing that? I said, I've been doing it every day for three weeks. He said, that's great. I said to him, some days I even stop by on the way home from school again. He said, that's good. That's excellent. He said, you want to play some basketball Thursday afternoon? I said, yeah, I love to play basketball. We started playing basketball every Thursday afternoon. Just him and me. He'd ask me, how's your prayer going? Ah, oh, it's good, you know. I'd ask him questions. I'd get distracted, you know, I'd start daydreaming. He'd give me answers. I'd ask him other questions he wouldn't have the answers to. He'd say, you know, let me find out. I'll get back to you. He'd come back next Thursday. He'd have the answer. After about three or four weeks, he said to me, how's that 10 minutes a day going? I said, it's going great. It's really good. He said, that's good, because I got something else for you. <laughs> I said, excuse me? He said, yeah, I got something else for you. I think now it's time for you to really get into the Mass. I said, no, I go to Mass on Sunday. He said, yeah, that's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> I said, well, what are you talking about? He said, now it's time for you to discover the daily Mass. I said, what? He said, the daily mass. I said, every day? <laughs> he said, no, no, don't, don't stretch yourself. You'll hurt yourself. <laughs> I'm thinking just one day a week, he said to me. I said, he said, just one day a week, go to daily mass. He says, it's different there. Something about the intimacy of it, it's powerful. I said, all right. So next Sunday I go to church, I pick up the bulletin. Daily mass? In my home parish in Sydney, 6.15 a.m. I'm not really a morning person. So then I saw in small print under that that on Tuesday nights they had an evening mass, 7.30. So I started going to mass on Tuesday nights. It was a big church. Grew up in a big parish in Sydney and big church and maybe 11 people. 12 with me, you know. <laughs> and it's just something about it. That intimacy of the daily mass. You just, you listen differently. You hear differently. And really it was there that I fell in love with the mass. Because it was there, I began to understand it. It, it was there, it became real to me. It came alive for me. And I began to listen to the prayers of the mass. There's genius in those prayers. You know, once you understand that God has this incredible dream for you to become the best version of yourself and that God wants you to help other people become the best version of themselves, and you start to listen to, listen to those prayers with that in mind, genius in those prayers. Some of them written a thousand years ago. Genius in them. You know, and I started listening to the readings. You know, and then I'd, I'd, I'd hear a reading and I'd go back and I'd pick up the Bible and I'd see, okay, what's that connected to? Where's that from in the Bible? And, and, and what... Or, what did that mean to the people of the time that it was written for? You know, and then my priest there, uh, he used to give like a one-minute homily. Really, one minute. Not three minutes, not eight minutes, one-minute homily each day. And it was just a nugget, you know. It was just enough to chew on, you know. And you, you could get your arms around it. And it was really powerful. I started going to Mass every, every Tuesday night. And then after a while, I started getting up in the morning. You know, especially if I had a big day. You know, if I, had, if I had something going on and I had to be in the zone, I started getting up and going to morning mass. You know, and what did I discover? That's how my best days began. You know, powerful stuff. We kept playing basketball on Thursday afternoons and I kept asking my questions and he kept giving me answers. And after a few weeks, he said, well, how's the mass going? And, yeah, I'm going well. I'm going once a week, twice a week, three times a week. He said, and what about the 10 minutes a day? I said, I don't know how I ever lived without it. You know, I don't know how people remain sane without some time in the classroom of silence to work out who they are and what they're here for. I don't know how people remain sane without some time in the classroom of silence to get reconnected with themselves and reconnected with God. 
I don't know how people do it. You know, and he said, well, that's great, because I've got something else for you. <laughs> I said, what do you mean, something else? He says, I think it's time for you to start reading the Bible. I said, all right, well, I, I've got one. <laughs> I think. Somewhere. And, uh, and he said to me, just read the Gospels. I just want you to read the Gospels for a year. Over and over and over and over and over and over and over for a year. Just 15 minutes a day, just read the Gospels. And what happened? I worked out who Jesus is, you know, in this time. What his life was about, what his teachings was about, how he lived, how he spoke, how he acted. And, and that's a question we have to answer. We have to work out who Jesus is, and we have to help people work out who Jesus is, because the reality is, Jesus is not a figment of someone's imagination. He is a person in history. We know this because, yes, Christians wrote about him, but we also know this because Jewish historians wrote about him, and we also know this because secular historians wrote about him. We know that this man lived. We have to remind people of that. You know, the ignorance of history is monumental, okay, particularly in the Christian world. Monumental. We have to remind people that Jesus is not just a story in a book. He is a man who lived and walked this earth. Because once we recognize that, we're challenged to answer. We're challenged to answer the question, who is Jesus? You know, and, and of course, most of the world religions, you know, other than Christianity, will say one of two things. Jesus was a great teacher or Jesus was a great prophet. These to be honest with you, are unacceptable answers. Why? Because who did Jesus claim to be? God. Claimed to be the Son of God. Claimed to be the Messiah. So if he isn't the Messiah, you can't say, hey, you, you didn't get the first prize, but we'll make you a great teacher. You know, you can't say, oh, you're not the Messiah. A bit confused about that, but you're a great prophet. You, it's, it's incongruent. Why? Because at the end of the day, he spent his whole public life going around convincing people that he was the Son of God. So if he wasn't the son of God, then he spent three years actively working to deceive the masses. Okay, And someone who spends their whole public life actively working to deceive the masses doesn't get called a great teacher and doesn't get called a great prophet. These things are incongruent. We've got to start to think on a deeper level. So it's, it's not good enough for people to say, oh yeah, Jesus is one of the great prophets. Or Jesus is a great teacher. It, it, these things are incongruent. We've got to get people thinking. Because three realities, and, and C.S. Lewis wrote about it, didn't he? He said, Jesus is either a madman, okay? Plenty of asylums filled with people who think they're the Messiah, okay? So Jesus is either a madman or he is a liar because he spent three years going around convincing people, trying to, that he was the Son of God. Madman, liar, or he is actually who he claims to be. And once you get into it a little bit, it doesn't take too much thought. I mean, what have we taken? Three minutes here? Three minutes here to take a look at it? Once you get into it, you start to recognize, yeah, he is actually who he claimed to be. And then his words have a different value. You know? Then he's, it's not just another self-help book now. It's not just another book of any other type. Because words have value according to who speaks them. Yeah. yeah. If someone you don't trust, if someone you don't respect, if someone who you don't think is authentic gives you a great message, you don't respect the message. The message could be true. But because you don't trust them, because you don't respect them, because you don't recognize them as being authentic, you don't listen to the message because words have value according to who speaks them. And that's, that's the discovery we have to come to with the Word of God. Delve into the Gospels. You know, just read the Gospels just over and over for a whole year. You know, why is it so important? Because, yeah, we pick up snippets here and there from church on Sunday. But it's not enough. And the danger is that we, we tend toward a gospel of convenience. You know, we tend toward a gospel of convenience. And I'll give you an example. You know, we, we read in the scriptures, Jesus said, pray for your enemies. He said, pray for your enemies, you know, and... Uh, Every Sunday we come to church, we have the prayers of the faithful. You know, we pray for everybody, don't we? Pray for the sick, pray for the almost sick, pray for the dead, pray for the almost dead, pray for the hungry, the lonely, the bored, the depressed, 
you know. But since September 11, I haven't heard a single prayer in any of our churches for Osama bin Laden. But that's the gospel. And not only that, if Father got up next Sunday and said, we're going to offer Mass today for Osama bin Laden, what kind of reaction do you think he'd get? But that's the gospel. People would walk out. But that's the gospel. We're drifting toward a gospel of convenience. Drifting towards a gospel of convenience. And we've got this me and Jesus thing going on. You know, with no accountability through confession or through church or through marriage or through anybody. We don't want accountability to anybody. So it's just this me and Jesus thing. And of course, the problem with that is that after a while, you know what we start to do? We start to create God in our image. Think about how dangerous that might be. In fact, take the next 30 days to reflect on the history of American Christianity and that single idea. And what have we done? We've created God in our image rather than being created in the image of God. It's dangerous stuff. We're drifting towards a gospel of convenience. It's dangerous territory. So I started reading the gospels. I started reading the gospels. I read them over and over, 15 minutes a day for a whole year. Powerful experience. You know? and, and people say to me all the time, where do I go from there? You know, do I just start at the beginning and go to the end? No, you don't start at the beginning and go to the end. Why? It's not even in chronological order. You, know, you get confused. You get five chapters into Leviticus. You know, you think, well, what's going on here? I tell people, you know, pick out your favorite story from the Old Testament. Find out what book it's in. Read the story. Read around the story and then read that book. Get a companion text that can talk to you about who the book was written by, who we think the book was written by, who it was written for, what it meant to the people of that time. You know, what sort of literature is it? Is it poetry? Is it prophecy? And discover that. And then go to another book. There's power in the scriptures. You know, the Word of God has just the power to transform our lives. And we know that instinctively. But one thing is absolutely certain. That is, the Word of God is not going to transform our lives through one quick reading on a Sunday morning in a church with a thousand people. We need to give it a chance to sink its roots into our lives. And I kept playing basketball, you know, with my friend, and he kept asking me, how's your prayer life? And he kept asking me, you getting to Mass? He kept asking me, you know, how's your reading of the Scriptures going? I said, they're, they're all going good. He said, that's good, because uh, I got something else for you. <laughs> I said, well, what do you got now? He said, what are you doing on Saturday afternoon? I said, I'm busy on Saturday afternoon. <laughs> Well, he said, well, what are you busy doing? Can you change it? I said, no, I'm busy being busy. <laughs> he said, come on, just, just give me two hours on Saturday afternoon. But I was resistant. I was resistant. I'm still resistant. But six, eight months into this process, this guy has changed my life. You know, he said to me, he said, I've asked you to do three things. Have those three things made you a happier person, a better person, move you closer to God, move you closer to being, you know, all you're created to be, your true self? I said, yeah. He said, why are you so resistant? Well, we've got that resistance in us. Yes or yes? <laughs> yeah, it's important that we recognize we've got it. Because the people we're dealing with, they've got it too. And for you to forget that they've got it is a monumental mistake. To live life, to manage people in the workplace, to work in ministry, whatever we do, we have to have a fundamental understanding of the human person if we're going to do it successfully. And one of the things we've got to recognize is they want to be happy, but they're resistant to the things that will actually make them happy. That's the reality. We've got to recognize that resistance. He said to me, come on, give me two hours on Saturday afternoon. I'll pick you up at two o'clock. Reluctantly, I agreed. He picked me up at two o'clock. We drove about 15 minutes from where I live, where I live with my family. And... Uh, we pulled up to a, a nursing home. Yeah, do they call it that in, in America? Yes. Nursing home. We go into the nursing home. He's got a box of chocolates. I'm thinking, all right, he knows someone here. We're going to go visit him or whatever. He walks up to the nurse's station. He says, is there anybody here who doesn't get many visitors? She says to him, pick any door in the hallway and you'll be in the right room. <laughs> so he goes to the first door. I'm following him. He knocks on the door, he goes in, there's this old guy in there. He introduces himself, he introduces me. He opens up the box of chocolates, he offers the guy a chocolate. Then we sit down. He just starts asking the guy, how's he doing? Asking the guy about his life. You know, I think I was, what, 
19, 18 maybe at the time, 17 even. And uh, he said, where were you when you were 17? This guy's just 17. Where were you when you were 17? What were you doing? You know? After a few minutes, got up, went to the next door, knocked on the door, went in, old woman, offered her a chocolate. He introduced himself. He introduced me, sat down, same thing. Did this for two hours. At the end of each visit, he would ask every single one of them the same question. What advice would you have for a young person? Powerful stuff. You know, I mean, I'm 35 today, and I've been speaking for 15 years. Ever since I started speaking, people have been saying, how do you know all this stuff? Few things. That for one. You know, the scriptures and good books for two. You know, traveling in 50 countries has certainly added to it, and the experience of the church and culture in 50 countries has, has certainly added to it. Primarily spending an awful lot of time in the classroom of silence. But this was a contributing factor. And I was uncomfortable in this situation. I'm not that comfortable around people a lot of the time, especially people I don't know. But it was a powerful experience. I loved it and I hated it all at the same time. And a lot of the things that God calls us to are like that. You know, he'd call me every, or every Thursday, we'd go and play basketball. He'd say, you want to go to the nursing home on Saturday? And I said, no, I'm busy on Saturday. You know, about once a month, I'd sort of give in. Mostly out of guilt. Yeah. I always had a powerful experience, but I just never wanted to go. And we kept playing basketball. And it was just powerful friendship. Powerful friendship with this guy. You know, and every week he'd ask me, how are different things going? You know, and I'd ask him questions. And if he didn't have the answer, he'd find the answer. And he taught me to do that for people as well. When they come to me with an answer about life or about my faith, and I don't know the answer, he taught me to be diligent, find the answer, get back to them with the answer. Because there's a real hunger there when people are asking questions. You know, and of course, you know, each week he'd, he'd say, how are they all going? And then from time to time, I'd say, you know, they're going great. And he'd say, that's good, because I got something else for you. <laughs> and of course, next on the list was praying a rosary. And I thought to myself, mate, you have gone too far now. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, he challenged me, just pray to rosary. Once a week, once a day, three times a day. You know, just gradually, really powerful prayer in our lives. Our culture's sort of abandoned it. I think the reason is, is because we worship complexity, number one. We worship complexity, but the reality is our lives are hungering for exactly the opposite of what we're worshiping, which is simplicity. And, and that's the real power and the genius of the rosary. I think in a, in a world of restlessness and a world of worry, in a time of restlessness and worry, you know, there's a real peace that comes to us through the rosary. But I think the real resistance for most people, the real obstacle for most people, is that for, you know, however many years, our, our non-Catholic Christian brothers and sisters have been saying to us things like, you Catholics, you worship Mary and the saints, don't you? What do we say? We say, um, I don't think so. It's convincing, isn't it? <laughs> so what do they come back with? They say, no, 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 I heard about you Catholics. You worship Mary and the Saints. We say, uh, I'm pretty sure we don't, but let me check on that and never talk to you ever again. <laughs> I mean, it's not like we didn't see this question coming. You know, it's not like we haven't been getting this question for 400 years. You know, it's not like they came up with this one last week. It's their question of the month. No, we shouldn't be shocked, stunned, amazed, or even surprised that this is the question. So you would think, with 64 million Catholics in America, that we could come up with an answer to this question. Maybe we could print it on a little card. Maybe we could print 64 million of them, pass them out one Sunday at church, and then we could move on to the next question. You see, the reason they haven't moved on to a next question is because we haven't given them an answer to that question. That's how it works. We give them an answer to that question, they'll move on to the next question. Then we'll give them an answer to that question, then they'll move on to the next question. That's how we lead them toward truth. So let's settle it. Do Catholics worship Mary and the saints? Absolutely not. So uh, what is it? What's going on there? Well, we believe in the power of prayer. All Christians do. We believe in the power of prayer. And if you got really sick tomorrow, you'd call your family and your friends and you'd ask them to pray for you. And if you knew someone who was really holy, a really prayerful spiritual person, you'd put them toward the top of the list. 
Yeah, because we believe in the power of prayer. Now, we believe that Mary and the saints are dead in this life. We believe they live on in the next life. And they know what it's like down here. We're not worshipping them. We're just saying, hey guys, we got problems down here. You know what it's like. Pray for us. Just like I'd ask you to pray for me if I was sick. Pray for us. That's what we're doing. That's what's going on. It makes sense. It's reasonable. It's spiritual. It's spiritually logical. And it makes sense. We've got to come up with answers to the questions. I think the other thing that we overlook, you know, when, when it comes to Mary and particularly to the rosary, is that I have to believe that Mary has a unique perspective. How many mothers here in the room? Mothers. Nobody sees your children's life like you see your children's life. Nobody, not even their fathers. A mother has a unique perspective. Nobody sees the life of a child like the mother sees the life of a child. That's Mary's perspective. I've got to believe that's a unique perspective. I've got to believe it's a powerful perspective. And I have got to believe that every Christian, Catholic or non-Catholic, would be interested in that perspective. I've got to believe that that's a perspective worth exploring for all Christians. And that's the perspective of the rosary. We ponder the life and teachings of Jesus Christ through 20 you know, bite-sized portions, 20 lessons, powerful lessons, and we ponder them through the eyes of his mother. There's genius in Catholicism. We have to start delving into it. We have to start delving into it. And the way we delve into it is only by leading people practically. We've got to lead people practically. We've got to work out what's happening in your life. Where does it hurt? Where does it hurt? This might help. We've got to lead people practically because at the end of the day, people are pretty self-interested until they get to a pretty high level in the spiritual life. Yes or yes? Yeah, people, let's not forget, fundamental understanding of the human person, people are fairly self-interested until they get to a fairly high level in the spiritual life. We expect them to discover God and all of a sudden lose all self-interest. Not going to happen. They're trying to make sense of their lives. They're trying to make their lives work. They're trying to make their marriages work. They're trying to make their families work. They're trying to work out... How do they relate to their 16-year-old kid? They're trying to work out how do they raise their families. They're trying to work out how in the midst of all of this they nurture their career and advance their career and balance their finances. We've got to talk to them about their lives. The other thing is that we expect people to come to us. And it's exactly the opposite of the ministry of Christ. Jesus went to the people. And that's the power of this ministry. That's the power of these CDs. You know, you're taking it to the people. You're not saying, oh, you people, you've got to come to church immediately. No, you're taking it to them in their life where they're at and feeding them in their lives where they're at. Will they come to church? Yeah, they will. Because it's just a natural progression, just a natural response. And so people come to God through friendship. We listen to people we respect, we trust. We listen to authentic voices in our lives. If people see you as a good friend, as a true friend, you can challenge them on anything. If people see you as a true friend, a good friend, an authentic person, you can challenge them on anything and they will listen to you. And that's the friendship that brings people to God. That's the friendship that brings people to the, their true selves, the best version of themselves, all God created them to be, holiness and, and, the, and the spiritual walk. We don't have enough people who know enough about their faith to offer that friendship to people. We don't have enough people who know about, enough about their faith to be really dynamic CCD teachers. And we don't have enough good Catholic school teachers. And we don't have enough parents who know enough about their faith to really steward and raise their children in the faith. We have a human resource crisis. And, and the only way we get it back is one by one. We got here one by one, we'll get back but one by one. I know you have seen the power of what one CD can do in a person's life. It's extraordinary. One CD, and a, a person's life can pivot on that one CD. Why? Because it finds them at the right time. They're open to the grace of God, and it probably speaks to something that's happening in their life at that right time. The right CDs, the right talks, the right message says to people, where does it hurt? What does it feel like? When did it start hurting? What did you do or stop doing around the time it started hurting? And then offers a solution like a doctor does. Here's the prescription. Now, when you walk out of the doctor's office, you're free to rip it up or take it and, and get the prescription filled. That's, that's, that's your free will. That's your free will. And people, same thing with the message. They can rip it up, throw it away, or they can take it on and, and, and fill the script. But I, th I think there's, there's genius in our faith. We have to begin to explore it. 
a little more. We have to challenge people to explore it. And we really have to develop those friendships with people. One person, I mean, here's a guy, he's a doctor actually, and he lives in Sydney, and he gave me this friendship, this spiritual friendship. Where would my life be without him? 50 countries later, 4 million people later, millions of books and millions of CDs later. That's his ministry. This is his ministry. And, and we can never underestimate what we're doing to help people discover God and to discover the best version of themselves. And that's a privilege. God bless you guys. Great to be with you. <laughs>
we just don't do this and don't do that and why did you do this and you should have done it that way and this is a better way. We need to be encouraged because that encouragement builds confidence, you know, and, and it builds a willingness to go out and try things and live life and experience life in, in healthy ways. So I think they just love me. Just love me. They love me. I'm just dying to ask this question. Yeah. This book changed my life, and I use it in my own workshops and seminars. And for 49 years, I kind of went a zigzag path trying to figure out, how did you ever come to that? Yeah, great question. So the question is, how did I come to that, the idea that our, our purpose of our lives is to become the best version of ourselves? And the answer is, well, when, when I first began interest, got interested in, in my Catholic faith, I started reading Catholic books. And, and then I thought, okay, what is the most significant event or recent significant Catholic event? And of course it was the Second Vatican Council. And I read the documents. I think I'm maybe one of the only people in the church who's read them, <laughs> you know? And, uh, and it's really sad how little they've been read, you know? I mean, I know lots of people have read them, but it, it's really sad how little they've been read. And really the overwhelming theme of Second Vatican Council was that we're all called to holiness. So the concept of the universal call to holiness. And I started speaking about that. Really, when I started speaking, that's what I would talk to. I'd say, every, God wants everyone to be holy. God wants everyone to be a saint. God wants everyone, you know, to, God calls everyone to holiness regardless of their age or their state in life. And I realized that after my talks, people would come up to me and say, thank you. You know, you really affirmed everything I, I've always believed. And that concerned me because I knew I had been given a mission to challenge people, not to affirm people. Plenty of other people out there who can affirm people, but to really challenge people. And I knew I had been challenged, given a mission to reach, reach out to people who, who weren't being affirmed. And what I discovered was the people who needed to hear the message couldn't relate to the language. You know, I mean, I talk to 60,000 high school kids a year. You go into a high school gym with a thousand kids and talk to them about the universal call to holiness? <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> and so if, if you read the writings, the language emerged in those first two or three years. If you listen to the different talks and you read the writings, the language emerged to the best version of yourself. And, and probably the first instance where you'll find it is in 95 or early 96. Um, and what I, I just came on it one day while I was talking. You know, and it just, I just saw the audience and the way they responded to it, and I knew instantly. And I just kept using that language. Um, th the concept that God wants us to become the best version of ourselves is, for me, in my mind, it's the same as the universal call to holiness. Because you can't tell me that Mother Teresa didn't become the best version of herself, or try to, or Francis of Assisi. You know, it, it, they may not have approached it that way. They may not have woken up in the morning and said, I'm going to be the best version of myself today. You know, they woke up saying, okay, I want to do the will of God today. I want to walk with God today. I want to be all God created me to be today. But different times require different language. And I think the language is fresh, it is new, and it is incredibly engaging to people. Of course, for some people in the church, uh, they don't know quite how to get their mind around it yet. And, and they don't realize that it, it really is a well-intentioned fr phrase. It really is. Uh, I think a lot of people would say, well, that's very self-helpy. And, and it really isn't, because if you become a better version of yourself, you become a better child of God. You become a better neighbor, you become a better citizen, and, and you become a me better member of the church. I think that's a challenge in, in my work, is that people misunderstand it or, or misrepresent it, but that's essentially how I came to it. Yeah? Lots of news today about the financial crisis and the bailout. What do you think is God really trying to tell us? I think we... We expect everybody else to have virtue. You know, we expect the leaders of our banks to act with virtue, essentially is what the, the outcry is. We expect the leaders of corporations to act with virtue. We expect our political leaders to act with virtue. We expect, we expect ed everybody in any position of responsibility or authority to act with virtue. But our culture is a culture almost completely devoid of virtue. So where the heck's all the virtuous people going to come from? You know, uh, and, th and that's the heart of the crisis, you know. At the end of the day, two patient people, I talk about in the seven levels of intimacy, two patient people will always have a better relationship than two impatient people. Not sometimes, not most of the time, every single time. 
So we, we have to get back to celebrating virtue. Uh, every, organize, every civilization, every society looks for an organizing principle. Okay, now some civilizations, some societies use greed as an organizing principle, some societies use fear or tyranny as an organizing principle. Our own society uses law as an organizing principle. Law backed up by the Constitution, uh, backed up by capitalism, really. So we use law and capitalism, and, and of course capitalism needs law to support it. Uh, we use law as our organizing principle. But if we ask ourselves, what is the ultimate organizing principle, the answer is virtue. And it, it, it is because two patient people will always have a better relationship than two impatient people. Two generous people will always have a better relationship than two selfish people. Two kind and thoughtful people will always have a better relationship than two thoughtless people. You know, two courageous people will always have a better relationship than two fearful people. Two humble people will always have a, a better relationship than two proud and egotistical people. And so if this is the way we relate, you and me, just you and me, if it was just you and me in the world, that would be the best, best organizing principle. Well, now I'll multiply it by se almost 7 billion people. But also multiply it by nations. Two patient nations will always have a better relationship than two impatient nations. Two generous nations will always have a better relationship. Two humble nations will always have a better relationship than two proud nations. And so the fundamental building block of a great society is missing. We expect everybody to have virtue, except ourselves. And of course, we forget that everyone else is living in the culture that we're living in. And, and so we, we, we have to get back to celebrating that virtue. Um, of the countries you've been to, which countries would you say need most, are most prayer? OK, question is, of the countries we've been to, which countries I've been to, which country needs most prayer? Um, let me change the question a little bit okay. and say, let's, let's talk about what's happening a little bit in the church around the world. Where is Catholicism most dynamic in the world? In America. I think most Americans would be surprised to hear that. I think it's important that we, we celebrate that. I think in America, um, if, if you talk about religion in America, people will argue with you. That's fantastic. That's a great thing, because you can engage that. Okay, if, if, at the other end of the spectrum, you've got what's happening in the church in Europe. Okay, the church in Europe is on life support, okay? And in, in Europe, there's a great indifference to religion and spirituality. People just, well, whatever. What's going to happen there is a, is a big job. A lot of work to be done there. And dynamic church in, in America. I would say Australia is, say, toward the upper end of this. It's closer to the American model than it is to the European model. Which countries need the most prayer? To be honest, I think America needs the most prayer. You know, we have a position of world leadership, socially, economically, morally, spiritually. You know, when it comes to foreign policy, when it comes to just about every area of our world leadership, I think we're handling it poorly. We have to change the way, we have to recognize that we are affecting everyone downstream really powerfully. Well, thank you. Welcome. Stop.